Thank you. So what was the most important innovation out of Europe over the last 50 years? Well, the most important European innovation over the last 50 years is the web. Of course, the web, which changed the world. And we will be remembered as the generation that got online. We are the first generation that got online. And when we got online roughly 20 years ago, we got a free and open internet. The question is, what kind of an internet are we going to leave for the next generations? Will it still be free? Will it still be open? And one thing that has changed about the internet and the web is the way we use it. Because when the web came around, we were surfing with our computers. And right now, there's uh, the rough amount of computers on this planet is one and a half billion. One and a half billion PCs. That's Windows and Macs and Linux boxes. And that's a lot of computers. But those don't matter. Because just during 2014, there were one and a half billion iPhones and Androids sold in one year. Think about that. One and a half billion iPhones and Androids sold in one year. As much as we have computers overall on the whole planet. So it is a mobile web. And it will keep getting more and more mobile. Now the internet has enemies. It has people who are trying to kill the internet. Or kill the free and open internet as we know it. Different kinds of enemies. First kind of an enemy many people think about are online criminals who do create problems for all of us. Online criminals running botnets, launching denial of service attacks, running botnets that steal money from our bank accounts, keyloggers, ransom trojans, you name it. Of course, that is a problem and that is a clear problem we have to fight. But that's not the only problem because they are not the most powerful enemies the internet has. For example, we have politicians like David Cameron, who over the last couple of weeks have be, has been very actively speaking about the need to outlaw encryption. To outlaw encryption, which means to outlaw privacy. He's been very vocal about this after the terror attacks in Paris, and for a very good reason, because the United Kingdom has had very serious problems with encryption throughout their history. I only have to go back about 300 years to find a good example from the time when America was still part of Britain. This is the so-called Jefferson Wheel. It was used by Thomas Jefferson, who later became the president of the independent United States of America. Because at the time, physical mail was being opened and read by European postmasters, including British postmasters. So if you wanted to communicate in private, you had to encrypt your letters. So that what, what, that's what Thomas Jefferson was doing almost 300 years ago. So what they're requesting now is that United Kingdom would not allow encrypted end-to-end -end communications. And while they're at it, why don't they also outlaw letters and make everybody to communicate with postcards so it would be easy to read it? This is a backward development, which will not work, because even if you outlaw encryption, I don't think the terrorists will actually follow the laws. If they want to encrypt their data, they can encrypt their data. So the only ones who will be suffering from these privacy losses will be legal uh, citizens like we. What about then Google? Well, Google is a monopoly. It is. And that's why, of course, the European Union wants to split Google. And by the way, it feels almost like a joke now that uh, roughly 15 years ago, the uh, European Union wanted to split Microsoft because they were such a monopoly. Of course, they are no longer a monopoly. But Google is problematic because they have such excellent products. Google's products are excellent. They're very good. So we want to use them. But we can't pay for them. We can't. They're free. Google Search is free. Google Maps is free. Gmail is free. And that's a little bit funny because Google invests a lot of money into these operations. If you actually go and look at Google finances, you'll find that Google invests roughly $2 billion into their data centers every quarter. 
That's four times a year, two billion into data centers. In fact, if you go and look at the lists of the largest server manufacturers on the planet, you'll find that companies like IBM, HP, and Dell are the three largest server manufacturers on the planet. However, number four is Google. Google is the world's fourth largest server manufacturer, and they don't even sell servers. They are such a large manufacturer because they build their own servers. That's how many servers they have in their data centers. So isn't it a bit funny that they put such a large amount of money into their data centers, yet the products are free? So you would think that a company like this would go bankrupt. But as we know, they're not going bankrupt. They make 12 billion in profit every year. Oh, that's what they made last year. That means that I made them $12 in profit just by using their services. And you know what? I would much rather pay that $12 in cash instead of play, paying with my data and paying with my privacy. But I don't have that option, neither do you. The only way we can pay is with our privacy. And there is no free lunch. There are no free web searches. There are no free cloud services. And there are no free apps. Every single app you download from the App Store or Google Play or anywhere, they're all free and none of them are free. They all monetize themselves one way or another. If they don't outright just try to make you buy something through an in-app purchase, then they monetize you and your data. And that's why we get applications like flashlight apps, which when you install it, require rights to access your email, to access your phone, to access your location, and to access the internet for a flashlight app which makes no sense, but that's how they monetize the app. There are no free lunches. So why do people click install? Why do they accept? Because they don't read it. What's the biggest lie on the internet? The biggest lie on the internet is that I have read and I agree to the license agreement. That's the biggest lie, and that's the lie we all do all the time. Nobody never reads the end user license agreement. And we know this because we tested this. We actually set up a free Wi Fi hotspot in November in London. And when you connected to the internet through our hotspot, you had to agree to our license agreement. And the license agreement had this one sentence buried in the middle of it, which said that by using this free internet access, you agreed to give your firstborn child to us. And everybody clicked OK. <laughs> now, we didn't actually follow through and go and pick up their children. We really should have done that, but we were weasels. We didn't actually do that. But the point stands. We don't really read and understand how our privacy is being eroded by all these free services. And then we have the enemies of the internet that are becoming completely, are, are actually on a completely different scale of attacks. Governmental attackers. The fact that governments, intelligence agencies, and militaries have become a player in the field of online attacks. We see malware being written and launched by governments all over the world. We see friendly governments hacking each other here inside EU. We see governments writing zero-day exploits, embedding them inside Trojans and launching them against other governments. This is happening from the United States, from the United Kingdom. It's happening from China, from Russia. It's happening from North Korea. It's happening from uh, Iran. It's happening from India, it's happening from Pakistan. And this is only the beginning. The Sony Pictures case, where they got hacked really, really badly and lost tons of data, happened because North Korean activity, which has been linked to the interview movie. And this whole story wasn't very clear to anybody. It didn't really make much sense that North Korea would be behind it. 
The United States government kept repeating that it is North Korean attack, but they never produced any evidence on how they know that. Well, actually, now we know how they know that, because there's an article in today's New York Times based on leaks, once again, from Edward Snowden, which explain how the US government knows that North Korea was behind the attack against Sony Pictures. They knew because US government had hacked North Korean networks beforehand. So they were watching North Koreans do it, as it happened. They were unable to prevent it, apparently, but they knew. So the internet has been with us for a couple of decades. The web has been with us for 20 years. Most of us started using the web around 1994 or 1995. We got a free and open net. The question is, what kind of a net are we going to leave to the future generations? Thank you very much.